very fortunate to be here. <laughs> You've heard me say a lot that a lot in this class. I don't know if you agree with it at this point. But the reason is I have a magnificent but also a somewhat ugly story to tell you, but it involves the final irrevocable unification of the patient I've been talking about, Gene. And I'm, I'm a little bit challenged to figure out how to tell it to you because I want to I want to condense into the next hour about uh, well it's a year and a half of our work that culminated in her synthesis into a whole person. And so once again, you know, how many hours am I talking about? I'm not talking about seeing her twice a week. It's seven days a week, often two hours at a time. So however many, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours. And I want to pull out again moments that reflect the journey and progress that she was making but I don't want to give you the misimpression that this work was ever easy. It was harder than hell every step of the way. And it only got easy when it was over. And then, it was, and then there was nothing to it. It was a breeze. It was a delight. And that's often what you find with very severe psychological disturbances. You go through hell with the person. And then finally a breakthrough occurs. A, a, a unification takes place. And it's kind of a variation on the idea of a transformative moment. Um, let's see, what do I have written on the board? I started to tell you last time the wonderful, lovely story of the, the inclusion of Sybil, the book and the movie, in the course of Jean's therapy. And I, I began the story, but I want to back up a little bit because I, there were other things happening that uh, I, I hadn't really covered yet, and I've kind of lost track in my memory of the precise order in which this happened and then this happened and then this happened. But it really doesn't matter, because aspects of Gene would be very advanced, moving toward the unification, while other aspects were still deeply committed to the splits, to the out-of-body journeys, to suicide as the final solution. So what do I have written up here first? I've got a, I've got a, a, a series of uh, events or circumstances that develop between us. And I've just written them, board, written them on the board, one through eight, really, okay? So let me just go through them. The exact order, I can't remember, and it really doesn't matter. Because you could have something happening one day that would show incredible strides of progress toward unification, and the next day she will have suicide on her mind, and she'd be cutting herself again or doing the damnedest things that were so difficult to contain and control. Um, I have dispensing with the out-of-body journeys. Let me just tell you this. I'm guessing this took place a year and a half to a year before she unified completely. Throughout our work together, and all the way back to when she was four years old, so she's now at the time 23, 24 years old, in terms of, in terms of the person biologically, chronologically that I'm dealing with. But since she was four, she's been traveling outside of her body, having been introduced to the possibility of this and the method of going about that by the ghosts that were the first caregivers of her life, the people she was closest to and loved the most of all, the ghosts of her father's dead mother and her mother's dead father. Remember, those were people she never knew physically. They died before she was born. But she saw their photos on the piano or on the, on the mantel, so she knew what they looked like, and they came to her, and they loved her and helped her and gathered her up, however one does that, and pulled her out of her body and took her to that very special place to the field. <coughs> The journeys out of her body to the field, by the way, continued throughout <coughs> our work. It's not they didn't stop. They kept happening. They were sporadic. Sometimes she would be, she would go weeks without a journey out of her body. Then I would find out she had once again traveled all over the world, gone to the Ukraine again, been communing with the ghosts, even as other parts of her seemed to be making great steps toward overcoming her traumas, remembering the horrible brain surgery, remembering the awful night party from hell, the nightmare birthday party, and all the other events that have taken place, okay? So it was like a, just a, a churning mix of different things. A step, two steps forward, ten steps back, a hundred steps forward, one thousand steps back, that's what it felt like. And it's, it's a, a terrible ordeal for a therapist who doesn't have much guidance to go through. I just almost went crazy. I would just crawl into my therapist's office and complain and moan about what it was like with her. I would sometimes go to friends and try to get help from them, but few people were much help. Anyway, let us say 14 months before the unification. I'll just make that up. It's roughly right. She came in one day 
and said that she had made a decision. I've made a decision, George. Which altar was saying this to me? I cannot, I cannot answer that question. I was at a stage where I couldn't tell them apart from each other anymore. And each one was showing features formerly belonging only to the others. Another example of that, maybe I'll just mention this. This is the kind of thing that was starting to happen. I told you that Kathy, the secret intellectual personality, uh, came in one day, but she was speaking with the British accent of Cassie, and I mistook her for Cassie, and Cathy was enraged. But it showed me that the British accent and some of the associated cultural sophistication of Cassie had leaked into Jean. It was the reflection of the integration happening. Okay? Another thing that happened one day, I, was, I thought I was talking to Jean number two, the loud mouth, extroverted girl that wanted to go hang gliding and that's all. Bubble gum chewing, joke telling. And I'll try to imitate a little bit what it was like. She said, you know something, George? That's because the others would never talk like that. They were real quiet. You could barely hear them when they spoke. You know something, George? And I said, what? I've been thinking. There's a real similarity between the figure of Socrates in Greek history and the figure of Jesus Christ. I said, really? What are you talking about? Well, they both are great heroes of their culture. They both were basically assassinated, sacrificed. They both have been instrumental for setting up traditions. And she began to give a little lecture on the parallelism between the figure of Socrates, who was made to poison himself to death by the citizens of Athens, and Jesus Christ, who, as we know, was crucified. That is not a gene number two thought. That's a deep Kathy thought. Kathy was like that. She would like look back on history, look back on mythology, and see all kinds of interesting symbolic parallels and connections. Though, you know something, George, Socrates and Jesus. So I didn't say, I believe that you're gene number two talking. I just kind of learned to be quiet now and, and kind of observe from a distance the redistribution of the qualities into the various altars amongst each other. And what, what a multiple really is, is it, it's like a person, a multifaceted person. And it's as if someone has taken all the qualities of one multifaceted person and written those qualities down onto little slips of paper and thrown them into a hat. And then what you do is you pull out three at a time, slips of paper, and then assign that to an altar. And then others get other qualities, and others get other qualities. And the stability of the system of multiplicity depends upon magnifying the differences between the altars. If they're too similar to each other, they, they tend to collapse. So there's like a motive to, to, ma to ma magnify <coughs> differentiation among them, to keep them separate, keep them apart. And why do you want to keep them apart? Because if you don't, you're hit by a, a tsunami of trauma that is held at bay by the multiplicity. And on only when you can begin to face that trauma with the help of somebody who works it through with you can, can then the, uh, the, need, the need for the differentiation separation begins to recede. Anyway, she came in one day and said, I've decided something. And I said, what's that, Jean? I guess I called her Jean. Or, or maybe I stopped calling her by name because I didn't want to be yelled at if I hit the wrong name. So I just began to say you instead. She was still using the first person plural we to refer to herself. We've decided something. I said, what's that? We're going to find the field. I said, what do you mean you're going to find the field? She said, the field is real. It's real. It's not imagined. And I've been thinking about it. And the more I think about it, I used to believe it might be in the Ukraine somewhere. But I've realized instead it's definitely in Canada, southern central Canada. And I'm going to go there. And I'm going to find it. And I'm going to spend time there. And I'm going, and don't you try to stop me. That's what she said like that. And I was very frightened for her uh, in embarking on a journey like this. Because what's going to happen to her if she goes up to Canada? What, how, is she gonna, how is she going to locate where the field might be? And what's going to happen if she actually travels there? And how is she going to get there? I mean, she, she had a driver's license. She, she was, I don't think she could you rent a car. Can you rent a car when you're only 23 years old? I don't even know. But I was very, very nervous. In Canada, you probably can, um, about her going. But she was really determined to do this. And we began to fight about it with each other. You're not going to Canada. You don't, don't, I don't want you going to Canada. Forget about it. You're not going to find the field. But she was determined to do it. And I'll make a long story short and say we hassled with each other for about a week. And finally, she came in again and said, I made my reservations, and I'm going. There's nothing you can do to stop me. But I noticed her eyes were on a little portable camera that I had on my desk that I'd been using for something else. Just a little thing about this wide, <coughs> smaller than the, than the camera we have here. 
And she said, I have a suggestion. I'd like to take your camera with me and take photos of the, of can of the Canadian landscape while I'm there. Can I do that? Take my camera. OK, I said, yes, take it with you. It was a nice little thing that I'd spent 100 bucks on at the time. And it was fine with me if she did that. She's going to go, she's going to go. There's nothing I can do. But I was really terrified. What if she gets up there in some obscure part of the Canadian forest or plains or something, and there's no field there? Is she going to look? What, what's going to happen to her? Because the field had been the one safe place she had been able to go her whole life. And she had still been going up until this time in our work in the out of body projection. She's talking about going there physically in three dimensional space and regular time. And so I, didn't, I just didn't know what was going to happen. I had to give up, though. I couldn't stop her. What, I'm going to put her in jail, tie her up? I can't do it. I was almost tempted to tie her up and say, you're not, not going to untie you until you agree you're not going to go up there. But it, you just, she was a person who could be real determined, and you just couldn't, couldn't put a stop to it. I was afraid it would end in suicide. She went to Canada and took a flight to Montreal, planning to... Uh, rent a car, and then drive into the wilderness and find the field. But then when she was up in Canada, she called me from there. She said she had fallen in love with the city of Montreal and had decided to cancel her trip to the field and instead be a tourist and take all the bus rides and all see the beautiful architecture and all this. And she came back with a massive, wonderful collection of photography and never heard another word about the field as long as we lived. She needed to go to find it. And she needed to change her own mind and instead experience the beauty of Montreal. That, this is just the way it happened. It was a b wonderful thing. And in the aftermath of doing that, she also announced something else. I've decided I'm not going out of my body anymore. The, the, the out-of-body journeys ended right there, and they never happened again. And the out-of-body journeys are another kind of dimension of her splitting. So it's, it's a dis dissociation on the one hand. The personalities are dissociated from each other. There's a memory aspect where each personality dissociates from the memory of the tra various traumas that otherwise would be flooding of them. But still another dissociation is mind and body. The, the, the phenomenological self, which normally is a mind-body unity, we don't distinguish between our minds and our bodies, separates into a mental and a physical part. And uh, it helped her to be able to do that to survive her traumas, as she had explained to me. She unified mind and body before she unified Kathy, Cassie, Gene 1, and Gene 2. So those four personalities were still there. And sometimes students have asked me when I've talked about this, which altar was it that would split off from the body and fly to the field? And I had never thought about this the first time it was asked of me, and I realized I didn't know which one it was. And then I thought more about it. It's almost as if that's not a question you could ask. It's like, it's as if, on the horizontal axis, she split into the four personalities, but on the vertical axis, she can split into mind and body separately. And those can just coexist without an answer being one of the four specifically is the one that goes in the out-of-body journeys. There's a lot of, that's why if you get too concrete about it, you come up with questions that you can't really answer and don't make any sense. You realize the whole thing is just kind of a mental mechanism for surviving what otherwise would be completely unsurvivable. There's something to the idea that multiple personalities are a trick. And I may have mentioned this before. I've heard people say, it's just a trick. It's not real. What do they mean by that? I think it's quite real. But it is a trick. There's truth in the idea that it's a trick you play with yourself. You trick yourself into thinking something didn't happen. And then you forget all about it. And you don't even, you're not even aware of it anymore. And it helps you survive to be able to do that. And the therapy, you have to untrick yourself, which means you have to face the things that you, that you otherwise were, were not able to survive. That's what this story is all about. So she quit <coughs> splitting off her body. It came to an end. She just announced it. I didn't tell her to do this. I didn't do anything to make it happen other than just stay with her, stay connected with her as best I could. Uh, Sybil, maybe a year before she unified, and I, I'll repeat what I said last time just very briefly and then tell you the rest of that story. It's amazing. It's a beautiful story. She called me one day, said, I have a book in front of me. What book is it? She wouldn't answer. I guess Sybil. She hung up on me. It was Sybil. And it turned out then that she had been secretly reading the book Sybil, had found it. I didn't give it to her. I, I basically never give my patients books. And I can't stand therapists who give books and recommend movies. Not that I haven't. I've probably done it once or twice. 
And there, there are some special reasons why you might do that. But basically, it's not a good idea. You have, you're, you're better off staying with where the person is, not trying to fix them with some doctrine that's in some book. So she found Sybil. And if I had another multiple, I would never give the book Sybil to that patient to read. What if they weren't ready for it? What if it precipitated a suicide because it prematurely closed down the system of altars, which could happen? Anyway, she had found it herself, though this is different. And she was able, haltingly, to explain to me that over the past three months, we're about a year before the unification now, but the other, well, the four personalities are still there, but they're similar to each other, but they're not the same, they're different from each other too. They have autonomy, but they share a lot of qualities. She said, uh, she was able to tell me that she'd been reading it, but she found something happening to her. When she would read the book Sybil, she'd open to a particular past set of passages in it, and she'd be able to read it for a page or two or three, but then she would come to a passage in Sybil where a description would be given of how one altar would replace another. So the Sybil personality might be present talking to the psychiatrist, Dr. Wilbur, and suddenly the Vicky personality comes in instead. She's there, has no memory of what Sybil's been doing. And what Jean said is when she would reach where Sybil turned to Vicky, Kathy, who might have been reading the, reading the book, would turn into Cassie, and wouldn't have any memory of what she just read. Suddenly Cassie would be there with no memory of what even this book was, but with her eyes on a page reading about Vicky. Then you read a little bit farther, Vicky turns into Vanessa, that's another Sybil character. You're gonna see the movie Sybil starting next time. And uh, Cassie couldn't stand that, it would flip into gene number one. So you understand? So, 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 so the shifts portrayed in Sybil would trigger analogous shifts in Jean, the patient, between her various altars, and she couldn't put together a kind of continuous memory of the story of Sybil, just bits and snatches of it, but they didn't fit together with the rest because it was carried by the other altars. But the fact that she was reading it, you know, I didn't say this to her, but it was obvious this is an incredible thing she's trying to do. Why would she read that? It must be because she needs to. And also, it's quite clear to me that Sib the story of Sybil is a mirror of the story of Sir Jean. It's the same story. The traumas are different, but you've got massive abuse, massive trauma, dealt with by dissociation, turning yourself into somebody else. You've got a system of altars. The therapy is the same, too. You cut, you, the, the trauma surfaces, you relive the whole thing, and the basis of the splits begins to crumble, and you move toward the unification. So that's Sybil's story. So it was a wonderful thing that she was doing this, and I was excited and encouraging of her, not that she needed my encouragement, but she had decided to do this herself. And it so happened that the first showing of Sybil, it was a made-for-TV movie with Sally Field. By the way, I consider this movie to be Sally Field's finest performance. Absolutely, it blows away everything else she did. I just think it's the most incredibly wonderful film on psychotherapy. And the people who say it's all made up to make money, with Hollywood, I hate those people. I'm going to have them all rounded up and kept in pens. Mm. And we'll just throw in some raw meat for them to eat sometime if they want. And maybe some corn cobs and some, and some, and some pails of moldy, musty water <laughs> to drink. I hate these people. They don't know what they're talking about. So just don't even listen to them. Just gate that out if you run into that. Um, the film came on. And so uh, she w tried to watch it, but the same thing happened. She wasn't able to watch it. She was able to watch, but she would flip. When Sybil flipped, she flipped. Flip, 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 and by the time the movie was over, it's two and a half hours long, uh, she, she didn't even hardly remember what she had just seen. But she was still very magnetically drawn to Sybil. And so then, this would have been maybe November when the film was first shown. November, what year, 79, 78? I don't know what it was, something like that. You could look it up, it doesn't matter. These, these are the years this is taking place. Um, there came time for the spring reruns. And in the meantime, the process of the altars getting more and more similar to each other had continued. And my ability to distinguish them was pretty much dropping out completely. And one of the announcements that she made to me during this interim period between the first and second showing of Sybil was, she said, by the way, you may not know this, but Kathy and Cassie are twins. In fact, they're identical twins. And so are Gene 1 and Gene 2. Isn't that amazing? She just outsprungs the idea that the four altars are really two sets of identical twins. It's, it's, an, it's another image forming that, that, that gives expression to the increasing, it's not unification, but it's like 
agonizingly slow steps toward it. So there, there that is again. There's still four, but it's two sets of twins. So it's getting closer and closer to being just two. And then just two is a step away from being just one, which we're moving toward. I could see this process. I knew if I hung on, it's, it's got to fulfill itself. But how long is it going to take? I have no way to know. So the, the spring reruns came in, came on. And she and I had a long powwow before agreeing to the following idea, that she would uh, watch the film again, but differently. She would call me just before it started from her home where she had a, a television set to watch it. We'd have a quick little five minute discussion about how important this film was. Then she'd watch it, call me during the interim, intermission. There's an intermission mission of five minutes. The film is long. Call me then, and then call me for the debriefing after the whole thing was over and tell me what it was like. And she had a new strategy. She said that she, they, the four altars, had a powwow amongst themselves. And they made an agreement that they would all watch the film. They would all kind of sit in chairs. How, how you do how this can be, since you're just one person, I don't know. They would keep their eyes straight forward. And each would be committed to helping the other three maintain the focus of attention on the film so that they would all simultaneously see all parts of Sybil, including Sybil's flick, 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 flickering between Vicky, Vanessa, Marsha, whatever, the boys, whatever the other ones were. There's a whole 16 all together there. You see what it is? And I said, and so I said, what's the hardest thing about this? And she said, it's a fear. And I said, what are you afraid of? And she then described twin dangers that made it almost impossible for her to do this, but she's going to do it anyway. The twin dangers were this, were these. On the one hand, she was terrified that watching Sybil, seeing all of it, and all parts of her seeing all of it, would cause an explosion of her system of altars into a kind of infinite chaos of individual little fragmentary personalities that could never be put together again. That she'd just blow apart in massive prolifer proliferating dissociations. That was one danger. Scared the hell out of her to think that this is going to happen if she watches Sybil. The opposite of that was also frightening to her, that her four remaining altars would implode and be kind of pressed and forced together like in, in a nuclear explosion where they implode the uranium-235 and it blows sky high. She was afraid she would implode into some kind of isolated singularity that wouldn't even be able to live more than one nanosecond. It would just die right then and there. So she's going to die through fragmentation or die through implosion if she forces herself to watch it. And there was a real battle, but all four kind of maintained their commitment. We're going to do this, God damn it. I'm, I'm saying God damn it. But that's kind of the ter determination that she had. So she did, she pulled it off, and the most amazing thing happened. This is not the unification, it's a giant step toward it. She said that uh, in, in, the, in the aftermath of watching the whole thing, it was successful. All four watched all parts. All four had a coherent memory of the whole story of Sybil from beginning to end. Sybil's history, her abuse, her splitting, her, her, her unification at the very end. Sybil unifies at the end of the story. She said there was something about it very, very difficult to watch, really more frightening that I hadn't realized was going to be. And I said, what's that? And she then described the final scenes in the film, which are very moving. And it takes place, if I remember it right, in a park where Sybil is, uh, maybe even has her head down on the lap of Cornelia Wilbur, her therapist, who's a very gentle, loving <coughs> mother to her through much of the therapy. It's kind of a wonderful, moving kind of romance between a mother and a daughter. Although she was not a biological daughter, she was an emotional daughter, for sure, to her. And uh, Cornelia Wilbur, the psychiatrist, starts using the L word, love, the word love. And she starts talking to Sybil. And she's kind of talking to all of them, because they're, they're in a state at this point where they also are not so separate anymore. And they're kind of all able to be present at the same time. And she goes like this, said, well, let me tell you something. I want to tell you all the ways I love you. I love you, Sybil, because of the shy ways you show and the sensitive girl that you are. I love Vicky because of her musical ability. And I love Vanessa because she knows French. And I love the French language. She knows all about French culture. And I, and I even love little Marcia, the poor thing that wants to die so badly. I don't love it if she wants to die. I just love her. I love the boys. I love. So she kind of goes through each one, all each of the sixteen, and says, "I love each one," naming the quality each one has had. 
And then she kind of rounds it out. And she says, don't you understand, Sybil? I love you. And that final use of the word you is a kind of embracing 16-part whole in her, in her language. And, and, and it's a, it, it sort of produces this effect on Sybil that contributes to her pulling together and crystallizing her personality. But what Jean told me was, and, and this is during the uh, re debriefing after watching the whole film, is panic set in. It was the greatest panic she's ever felt in her whole life. I said, what is the panic? She said, the altars were so frightened, they felt like they had been confronted by the ultimate threat to their existence, the deadliest threat of all. And what they wanted to do is run to the far corners of the universe, one this way, one that way, one that way, and one that way, to get as far away from it as possible. It was the, it was the word love. Love threatens the stability of a system of multiple altars. And if you think about it, it's right. It has to be the, 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 the preservation of a stable system of alternative selves is kind of based on a despairing premise that you can't trust anyone in this world. And you have to handle it by yourself, and you do so by having this little community of altars that split up the different things that have happened to you in a certain way. But when you come into a relationship with someone who has for you an embracing love, it destabilizes the multiplicity. It brings out the suffering and the pain and the trauma, and the, pa and the patient's going to come together. So the greatest, so it leads to a principle. The greatest threat to, to the stability of a person with m multiple personality definitely is love. More trauma is not a threat at all. Like you might, you might have thought, well, no, the greatest threat to them would be a repetition of their horrible traumas. That's not right. They are geniuses of mastering trauma. Like if you just sadistically rape a multiple, she's going to have no problem. She's been, she's been for years worked out a way to handle anything like that. Atrocious attack, she's an expert at handling. What they can't handle is love itself. So it's, it's just so moving and so wonderful. And it's wonderful that Jean was able to survive even that part and hold on to that. So that was a big step for her. So it sounds like she's really getting there, doesn't it? But then on the other hand, she still would have these terrible suicide crises. And I thought I would mention the last one, which is vivid in my memory. I, I told you how she would come to my door with all my books, thank you very much for all your work with us, and all this kind of thing. We won't need, be needing to see you anymore, but we're forever grateful to you. And I would know she's planned another suicide. She's got the gas all ready to go, or the pills are ready, or maybe she's got a knife she's going to cut her throat with, or her wrists, or something. And uh, over the four years that had elapsed by this point, a kind of pattern had worked out around the suicide crisis. She would be good. She was good enough to come to me and let me know indirectly that it was in the offing, the suicide. I would then block the door so she couldn't leave. You're gonna, if you're going to leave and do this, you're going to have to pass through solid flesh, is what I would say. And I meant it, that I would do it. Then we would have a god-awful wrestling match as she tried to attack herself, scratch herself, stab herself, get out the door, jump out my window, do anything she could to kill herself. Uh, and then after an hour, hour and a half of this wrestling, which was exhausting and somewhat dangerous, actually. I was hurt a number of times in these fights. Uh, then <coughs> she would break, and the crying would start, and I would know the immediacy of that suicide crisis was past. And then we'd spend another hour talking about what had just happened, and what, what had transpired between us the previous week, maybe that she had put two and two together, it meant I didn't like her, love her, care for her, was leaving her, something like, something like that. She would interpret anything that way. It was a memory of multiple abandonments and traumatic persecutions that she had been through. She'd see me, mix me up with all of that. Anyway, and, and this, this was the last time. It was exhausting to do this. I got so I, I, got, so I didn't want to do it anymore. I, I was dreading these wrestling matches. They were painful. And then, and then, so the last one, we were fighting like hell for about a, an hour or so, and she'd pull, wrench away from me, go in the corner, then come back and try to go out the door, and I'd block it again. She'd be wrestling with me some more, go in the corner. So I remember just being exhausted, just exhausted, collapsing against the blackboard. I wasn't down on my knees or, or sitting down or anything. I was just leaning against the blackboard. She picked up a, an eraser from my thing there. I had a blackboard and an eraser there. She went over to the other side of the room, and then she threw it at me with all her strength. The eraser got me right in the balls. I couldn't believe it. Bam! I went down. You know, like, do you do that? If somebody kicks you there, or you throw something at you, it hits you, a baseball. You see the baseball players, down they go. 
<laughs> really doesn't feel good. It just feels like an electric bolts have gone through you or something and you can't even stand. So I'm lying there on the floor, not, not permanently hurt, but really miserable, and something broke inside of me. And I just said to myself, I don't give a shit what she does. She's going to kill herself. She's going to kill herself. I can't stop her. I'm not fighting with her anymore. This is the third time she knocked me down. She'd done it twice before, not in that way. She caught me, we'd be fighting, and she'd catch me with an elbow in the jaw, knock me down twice that way. I thought, three strikes and you're out. That's it. She's going to kill herself. She's going to do it. So I found a way to say that to her. I said, Jean, if you're going to leave now and go and kill yourself, guess what? I'm not going to stop you. <coughs> I can't do this fighting with you anymore. I just can't. You just hurt me. I want no part of any of this. If you want to live and you're willing to live, you know I'm not just closing you out. I'm here with you. But I need you to want to do that and stop with the suicide. And guess what happened? Suicide went poop. There was never another trace of it. It just disappeared. This is a case where you run out of patience. You know, the tolerance, the patience with something, just when the person's really ready to give it up anyway. It's kind of analogous to a mother who's all giving and all, all loving and always there for her little baby growing up and gets to toddlerhood and so on. And the mother starts getting frustrated and finally can't stand it anymore. She has to come running every time the child squeaks. And so she just won't do it anymore because she's disgusted with having to do this. But it's just when the child maybe is ready to advance a little bit and tolerate aloneness better and this kind of thing. So something like that happens. Working with these people is analogous to raising an infant, but it's different than raising an infant because an infant hasn't been hurt. <coughs> These people have, they both haven't developed, but they also have been terribly, terribly hurt. So it's very different in that way, too. But if you really understand that, you can get through a lot of it without suffering as badly as I did on this first one, didn't understand it. So suicide came to an end, but that was easily the 25th time we had had major battles, like Godzilla versus King Kong, wrapping ourselves around each other, trying to get through, get through it. So we got there. What do I have next? I said, suicide plans attempts finally after 25 separate episodes received, but not without knocking George A. down one last time. I have had it. That was my reaction. But I, ha I was able to have it and be OK with it long enough. So it was good. Next, let's imagine three weeks later. This is after Sybil, after suicide disappears, after the out-of-body journeys have ceased and she's come back from Canada with her beautiful album of photography of one of the greatest cities in the world, Montreal. Um, she came in one day and said she had something to say to me. And I said, what is it? She said, and it, I'm going to imitate what she was like. It was funny, but it was interesting, too. She said, I've realized something. I said, tell me what you've realized. I, I, I'm, m, I, I, and she took about a minute or two to get these words out. I'm, m, m, I'm a, I'm a mo 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 mo. I'm a mo 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 multiple multiple personality. And then she didn't want to talk about it at all. You know, it's like forget I said that. She didn't say forget I said that, but it was like it wasn't to be discussed. But she got the words out, and that's a powerful thing. That is another step along the journey. She's not all there, but she's really getting there because this, if you think about that statement, I am a multiple personality. What is the I? that is being referred to in, in that statement. If I'm a multiple, that means there's an I that embraces a multiplicity. So it's a huge, a huge step toward the whole thing. This is maybe nine months, eight months before the final unification, which I'm about to tell you about. <coughs> and then I'll bring you up to date on what's happened in the 40 years since. A dream of the coffins I have written up here. Perhaps a few months after announcing that she was a multiple, even, and even in spite of announcing that, it doesn't mean that the four altars are still not coming and going. They are. But they don't have really any amnesia with respect to each other. They're all kind of simultaneously present. But there's a multiplicity that's present. There's still a we going on. It was, it was a new thing for her to use the first person pronoun, I. But most should revert back to the we this, we that, we this. Anyway, um, she came in and said, uh, we had a dream last night, a very important dream. And I said, tell me your dream. And I can't remember if she said I or we. It's an interesting question. I think she might have flipped back and forth between first, and first person singular, first person uh, plural. 
and the account of the dream, which the dream itself flips back and forth. The dream was that she saw on the mantel above the fireplace in the home she had grown up in, she wasn't living there then, she was living in her own apartment now, uh, four coffins, four boxes that seemed to be coffins. So you have to imagine a big mantelpiece and then four boxes, each one's a coffin, uh, kind of sticking out from the edge of the mantel. And there were bodies inside the boxes. And so I heard that, okay, there's bodies inside the coffins that are on the mantel. And it was obvious that the four bodies inside the coffins were the four altars. What's, the, what is, what's it going to be? It's, obviously, that's a picture of it. I didn't even say that. It was implicit. Why they were coffins, why they seemed to be dead, I wasn't sure about that. But I didn't say anything. I often didn't interpret anything with her. I just listened, listened, listened. But I'm thinking hard about it at the same time. Then she said, I woke up, and it was very scary. I said, what happened then? I fell back asleep. I said, what happened then? The dream continued. And I said, well, tell me about the dream continuing. She said, suddenly there were not four boxes, there was just one. And in the box that replaced the four boxes on the mantle, there were four bodies inside of it. But they were facing inward toward a central point there. And then she made an amazing interpretation. This would be the brilliance of Kathy personality to be able to talk this way. She said, I think I know what the dream may mean. I think, I think she was using first person plural, singular now. I think I know, may know where it mean, what it means. I said, tell me what you think it means. She said, the shift from four to one is a dream prelude to the unification of my personality where the exterior boundaries, these are, this is a quote from her, the exterior boundaries of the final box that has all the four bodies in it represents the developing structure of the unitary self. That's a quote from her. She's a genius. All multiples are geniuses, by the way, in case you didn't know. And she was not an exception to that. So she said, the shift from four to one is a prelude to unification, the external boundaries of the developing structure of the unitary self. I was blown away by that. What are you going to say to that? Cool, is what I said. That's very cool, and it's really wonderful. And I thought to myself, she is really getting somewhere, but she's not there yet. So we have maybe another six months, five months, four months before the dramatic moment came. And there's another inter incident that happened in between them, in between the, the dream and the final unification. It's kind of amazing, and I love to tell this story. I call it the, the hallucination of the shattering glass. Um, she came to visit me one fine day. I was seeing her five, seven days a week still. The, the work was hard, but it was easier. Suicide was gone. And we're just talking about what she's going through, her, situ her external situations in her life, as well as her dreams and whatever. I'm not interpreting a lot. I'm doing a lot of listening is what it is. So one day she came in and said she had just met a student who was doing research with uh, something that's called the Myers-Briggs Jungian Type Inventory. Maybe you've heard of that. It's a paper and pencil test that you can take. And you answer a bunch of questions, you agree or disagree or something of these questions. And, it, and, it, and then, and then the, pro the profile that is generated by what you agree and disagree with kind of gives you a rating on the degree to which you're an introverted person versus an extroverted person. That's, those are your young in categories. Or the degree to which you're a thinking person, a judging person, a sensation, an intuition person. These are young in types and categories. It's kind of cool. And paper pencil tests are really ridiculous and pathetic, actually. They're, they're not worth really anything, except for psychologists who try to quantify, because psychologists are nuts in love, in love with quantification. Let's not go there. We don't have to talk about all that. But, but it, as, as such things go, it's interesting, the Myers-Briggs type inventory. And I've known many people who did research on it. And so then I had a really dumb idea. But this dumb idea led to something interesting. It occurred to me that it would be interesting to uh, have the different altars that still remain, Kathy, Cassie, Gene 1, and Gene 2, separately take the Myers-Briggs type inventory. Then you could get four different profiles and see how similar or different they were. So I said, Gene, I said, you know what would be kind of cool? She said, what would be kind of cool, George? I said, well, maybe the, all, the different ones, you know, the four, could separately take the Myers-Briggs type inventory. We could just see how they how their profiles came out, how they compared and contrasted with each other. Then she then she froze when I said that. She went, <laughs> and I said, what's going on? Silence for 30 seconds. And then she's shaking and shaking and shaking. And finally I got her to talk. 
I said, what just happened to you? She said she had had a bright, vivid hallucination as an apparent reaction to my suggesting this. And I said, well, what, what did you see? She saw an immense sheet of transparent plate glass in front of her like this, like from one side of the room to the other. And it was as if someone had thrown a pebble or a rock at the plate glass, and it had struck the glass right in the middle. I have, I have sort of a picture of it, and, and, and at the point of impact, a kind of spidery shattering of cracks appeared going in all directions. And she didn't have to offer an interpretation of the meaning. It was obvious to me what had happened. The developing unity of a, of the developing structure of a unitary self was present. And what I had done is thrown the rock by emphasizing the differences between the altars with the Myers-Briggs type inventory. And, and, and the shattering impact on the emergent unity was concretely visually symbolized by the rock hitting the glass and the glass shattering. I didn't interpret it or anything. I said, I'm sorry I said that. Let's go on, let's go on to something else. We changed the subject, and apparently the cracks healed up, and it was fine. But it was a, kind of an amazing thing that the unity that she was beginning to feel seemed to need not to be spoken of explicitly, and certainly not undone by some idiot saying it would be a good idea to administer the altars of personality <coughs> test. Anybody who wants to administer pa pa patients with different personality tests, it's just all, all screwball. It's, it's, it's defeating and betraying the process of the therapy, which is to deal with the pain and help them become whole. Anyway, it can't have been more than two weeks after that that it happened, and it was like this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna enact part of what it was and try to draw you into the drama of it, and I hope you can imagine this, and I wish I had a film of it, and when they someday make a film of my life, this will be part of that film. They're not going to do that. But if they do, there's a lot of stuff going to be in there, but this will be one of them. I'm waiting for her for our appointment, not thinking anything special is going to occur that day, but I'm, 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 I'm clear on the, the drift toward unification that's taking place, obviously. So she comes walking into my office. Good morning! And I'm, she stands there in front of me like this, with her hands on her sides like this, and she's got a sparkle in her eye. I see that r real clearly. I say, what's up? And she says it just like this. We are me. We voted last night, and we all agree. That was the opening statement that she made. I was smart enough not to say, if you're really me, just one, why did you need to take a vote? Might have had more shattering glass if I had done that. You know, The, the statement itself mirrors the process of unification occurring. And what you need to do at a moment like that is just accept it, witness it, mirror it, and shut the hell up from any saying something intelligent sounding or something. So I think I just said, wow, and that's great, and it sounds wonderful. And she walked over to my desk. And my desk was covered with you know, scotch tape and papers and pencils and nothing terribly breakable. But it was just cluttered up like mad. And she made a big production of this. She put one arm down on the side of the desk and just scooted, scooshed off everything that was there, like whoosh, crash goes all the stuff. So then my desk was clean. Then she reached in her pocket and pulled out a bunch of look, look first looked like playing cards, but they weren't. And she dealt out twelve pieces of paper onto my desk. So you got these twelve pieces of paper, each one about that big and that wide. And I noticed there were things written on these twelve pieces of paper. I thought, hmm, what is this? And I'm looking at it. And then I saw that on six of the pieces of paper, they were all scrambled up, though, were the names of the altars. Gene One, Cassie, Abraham, Cassie, Kathy. The, the, name, the names were there. And on the, on the other ones, there were little sentences, or two or three sentences even written in small little letters. I'm looking at those, and I see that the, the other ones <coughs> contain, uh, they, they, they refer to the traumas that happened, that triggered the split that led to the various altars. So like the bris was one of the things, the circumcision bris was written on there. And the brain surgery was another one. And the party from hell was another one. And the whole business about never being held again and touched again, affectionately at least, was another one. And the one about being closed out of Judaism and being denied the opportunity to become a rabbi and being cut off from literature of Judaism and so on, that was another one for Abraham and so on. Okay, 
But so she said, do you think, she's standing there like this still, all proud of herself, said, do you think you could match which one goes with which one? Like that. And I'm looking at these things and fiddling with them, and I say, well, I believe I could, I should be. And I'm thinking to myself, after the thousands of hours I've spent going over the darn thing, I, if I can't do it, I've, something's really wrong. So I start playing with them like a little puzzle. I'm going to put them together. She grabs me by the half, by the, by the collar and by the arm, and just drags me away and throws me against the wall. But it, not to hurt me or anything. Allow me. And then she gets the pieces of paper, and she arranges two closely juxtaposed columns. I've gotten them written on the board. And they're, they're in perfect chronological order. Kathy, Cassie, Abraham, little girl, G number one, G number two. And she put, she juxtaposes right next to it the, the trauma that each one was born from. With Kathy, it's birth. There's no trauma there. Kathy's a residual personality from five traumas that caused five altars to split off. So there's five traumas, six altars. Cassie, I, won't, I will never touch you again or hold you again. Abraham, you're barred from ever becoming a rabbi and from Jewish studies. Little girl, the bris. G number one, the party from hell. G number two, the brain surgery, okay? So she arranged them all like that, stood back, still all proud of herself. That was it. And this has been the amazing thing. Her personality fused and unified. I never heard another word about it. I've never spoken another word about it. I still know this person. It's been 90, 30, 33 years, I think, since, since the, the events that I just described took place. Not one word has been spoken about her multiplicity. Six months after this unification moment happened, uh, I had the following conversation with her that I thought was relevant to it. It was really interesting, too. I was taking her on a... On a, I had her in my car, and I was taking her for a sandwich, grilled, grilled cheese sandwich and french fries at a diner or something. And I remember as we were driving over to the diner together, she said, you know, George, I was thinking about something. And I said, what's that, Jean? All the names disappeared except for Jean, which was her given name. It's not literally her name, but it's the name I use for her. Um, I was thinking that, that a tragedy has befallen contemporary academic intellectual world. And it's been actually for a long, it's been existing for a long time. I said, what are you talking about, the tragedy? She said, well, human knowledge is divided up into these separated compartments, these grand dichotomies. Like, for example, people make a distinction between the humanities on the one side and the sciences on the other. They have a lot more in common than that which differentiates them from each other if you really understand science and you really understand art and the humanities. And then furthermore, each of the individual fields, for example, in the sciences, chemistry, biology, physics, and she gave a little discourse on how the great discoveries almost always occur at the boundaries between these different subdivisions that are there, showing that there's a deep unity in the whole thing. She says psychology is the worst of all, developmental psychology, social psychology, physiological psychology. It's just ridiculous, the fragmentation. And as I listen to her just hold forth on this, I agree with her. She's right. It is a tragedy in the intellectual world. But I heard it deeply, too. And I didn't say anything about this. I just witnessed it and, and registered it and loved it. I heard, I heard someone telling me, placing the greatest values that she believed in in a focus on unification as opposed to diversification, separation, alienation. And it shows that what, ha what happened is she unified is, is that the whole survival strategy based on dissociation had been given up. And she was instead now leading a life based on, based on being a personal unity itself. And, and uh, it makes sense then to me how it is that you, you don't go back. And, th and this is true. All, everybody who works with multiple personality and those few who take, who take it all the way to a unification report the same thing. The people who don't go back. They give up the strategy of dissociation as a life as a life survival method. And uh, they may, may still have crises, but they don't deal with them that way anymore. So it's an amazing thing that they do not go back. They don't become schizophrenic. They just become whole. And it seems to be irrevocable. Now, what did Jean do with herself? Her life is, is interesting, amazing, but really, but in other ways, kind of boring compared to what she was like with all the exotic symptoms and out-of-body journeys and the field and the ghosts and all of that. She began to lead a life that just is a life. 